live, going live. All right, let's take a look here. Okay, we are live. All right, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Hey there, students. Tom Ritchie here, and it is the night before the AP US government and politics exam. So let's go ahead and get some review going. Now, I've got a kind of a dual audience here. We got some folks on, uh, we've got some folks here on Crowdcast. Um, we've got some folks here on, uh, you know, on YouTube. So a couple of uh, different chats here that I'm going to be going through every once in a while and be looking at YouTube. Now, YouTube, if y'all want to join us on Crowdcast, there's a link there in the in the description. Hey, Devin. All right. We got some people on YouTube. We got the new master there. And remember, um, everybody, that at nine o'clock p.m., I'm going to be going live with Marco Learning. OK, so I'm going to be on Marco Learning's channel at nine. I'm going to be streaming here until about 845. So if you want to join me on Marco Learning's channel, that is going to be there in the description if you're on YouTube. And of course, there is also a pinned chat there. OK, and those of you in Crowdcast, I'll make sure to share that link with y'all. OK, so this is the link to the Marco Learning 9 p.m. stream. OK, so that's what I'm going to be doing there. So that's a little word from our sponsor. OK, so at 9 p.m., I'm going to be on Marco Learning's channel. I'm going to be working, uh, you know, working until then. OK, so going from there, let me make sure I've got everything kind of set up here. So I'm ready for some questions. And until we ask, oh, we've got some questions. Excellent. So again, um, let me go ahead and take you all to some resources here real quick. So we're going to go to MarcoLearning.com and we are going to take a look at a few free resources that you, know, you might find interesting if you are studying for the AP government and politics exam. So if we go to marcolearning.com, free resources, okay? So we can go to practice test. I mean, if you wanna take a practice test tonight, there you go. Now, if we go to study guides, okay? So let's go ahead and go to study guides. And this is going to have here, we've got two study guides for AP US government. We've got Supreme Court cases, okay? Then we've got foundational document summaries. Now that'll probably be a lot of what we're going to be focusing on tonight. We'll be looking at some course concepts for AP government, but also study guides and foundational documents. So Marco Learning, they've got um, some things here. You've got all of the foundational documents summarized. And then here we've got the 15, well, on this exam, 14 Supreme Court cases, because remember, the College Board has reported that Roe v. Wade is not going to be one of the Supreme Court cases. It will not be on this year's exam. It might be on an exam in a future year, but it's not going to be on this year's exam. So with that, uh, remember MarcoLearning.com, and you can go to the free study guides, and you've got some great resources there. So, and remember, I'll be on Marco Learning's channel at 9 p.m. Eastern, okay, youtube.com slash Marco Learning. So, if you haven't subscribed to that channel yet, go ahead and do that. So, with that, let's go ahead and get into, can I go over, okay, now the argumentative essay is the, I think I'm going to save that for the Marco Learning broadcast, okay? So, I think at 9, when I go on to Marco Learning, I'll focus on the argumentative essay, okay? So, so that's something I think that'll be more suited for that broadcast. So let's go ahead and save that. And in the meantime, I will go into um, some things here. Okay, so let me go ahead and pull up the, the course and exam description. Because some of these questions, I just, you know, sometimes I just want to double check. I just want to double check and make sure that all of that is, is there. Okay, so we've got this. Let's go ahead and nope. All right. Let me just note here, just going to open this up real quick. Okay. So, yes, it looks like we've got a few things there. Okay. So, yes, affirmative action is topic 3.13. Okay. So, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, that we'll go ahead and make a, make a note here. 
So affirmative action, somebody is asking, we've got uh, Caitlin is asking, what is affirmative action? Okay, so affirmative action, this is something that as we are, uh, you know, going into uh, the civil rights movement, okay, so, you know, for example, when we think about getting rid of discrimination, so the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for example, so let's go ahead and note the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Two things about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that it basically banned segregation in public accommodations. All right. So if you own a hotel or a restaurant, um, you cannot segregate that. You cannot refuse to serve people based on their race, their ethnicity, their gender. Civil Rights Act of 1964, no more segregation in public accommodations. And this is, of course, a federal law that applies to the country as a whole. So no segregation in public accommodations. The second thing about about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is that there can be no discrimination in employment. So that mandates that everybody, that every employer be what's called an equal opportunity employer. Now, religious groups are exempt from this because if they've got on religious grounds that they are discriminating, that's something that the Constitution would protect because of their freedom of religion. But generally, an employer has to say that, you know, I am an equal opportunity employer. And it looks like I've got, uh, you know, hi, Sienna. Um, Vicky is on my screen, it looks like there. Um, so with that, uh, so that's one way to do it. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, that we say that there's going to be no discrimination. And then, of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, the Fair Housing Act, um, this is something that when we think about the Fair Housing Act, that bans any kind of discrimination in housing, whether I'm selling my house or whether I'm renting property. So that means that you can't say that I'm going to discriminate based on race, ethnicity, gender, any kind of qualifications like that. So before the Civil Rights Acts passed, there was nothing stopping people from discriminating. Now, this is where you get into kind of a liberal conservative divide, because from a conservative perspective, you know, looking at those civil rights acts and saying, OK, we got rid of legal discrimination. OK, case closed. Whereas, you know, a more liberal perspective would be to say that, OK, these groups have faced discrimination for quite a long time. And so what we need to do is we need to take affirmative action, okay? Affirmative action means that if you have um, an applicant for a job or you have an applicant for um, a university or medical school or something like that, that let's say that I've got uh, these two candidates, okay? And that there is, on, one of them is a white male, okay? And then the other one is, um, a Hispanic female. Okay. So you see these two applicants, they seem to be, you know, about the same here. And you go with the Hispanic female because you're saying that, you know, the white male has had, you know, privileges and advantages. And so you're taking affirmative action for the person who was, um, you know, considered to have been discriminated against in the past. So, you know, as far as that goes, that this goes into, it gets, it gets kind of controversial. Now, one thing to note that polling shows that Americans of all races and ethnicities, a majority of Americans actually opposes affirmative action and saying that, you know, the processes of admissions, of employment should be colorblind. Even a majority of black Americans says that, you know, it is, you know, that affirmative action, they don't agree with it, okay, that it shouldn't be the case, that the hiring decisions, the admissions decisions should just be based on merit. Now, here's the thing as far as where the law stands now, according to the Supreme Court. So you had a case, it's not one of your required 15 cases, but Bakke versus the Board of Regents of the University of California. Bakke was a white male who had applied to the University of California Medical School. And so he didn't get in. And he didn't get in, but it wasn't because he was, you know, they were going to take 100 people and he was one of the 100 most qualified. But the University of California in the 1970s, they adopted a strict quota system. They said that we are going to have 
X number of seats that will not go to white males under any circumstances. We are going to reserve these for minorities. So what happened with Baki is, you know, his qualifications were actually substantially higher than someone else's who got in because of the quota system. So in Baki, what the Supreme Court decided was they didn't outlaw affirmative action outright but they said that it could be one of many considerations. So you can consider race as one of many considerations for admission, but you can't have a strict quota system. And so again, affirmative action, it's a, it's a controversial policy today, but there, you know, there are debates about this, whether it's enough just to say that we have a non-discriminatory policy, or if you should take affirmative action to help this person who comes from a historically disadvantaged group, okay? So that's what we have there. And of course, affirmative action would be a great argument essay topic. You know, if you think about putting the foundational documents and Supreme Court decisions and course content in a perspective, that how would you use the foundational documents to come up with an argument for or against affirmative action? And so as far as that goes, we can do a little poll here in the Crowdcast. Uh, let's see. So let me just go ahead and do a little poll. Um, do you think that a person's, uh, you know, a person's race, ethnicity, or gender should be considered, um, you know, for uh, university admission? or employment okay so as far as that goes um yes i'm um, you know or no let's see what we've got here just to go ahead and put a poll there um, and see what uh, what y'all think here those of you in the crowd cast um should someone's race ethnicity or gender be considered for university admission or employment so with that let's go ahead and see what we've got here in the chat all right, so take the poll. No, no, no. As far as that goes, uh, Vicky is not leaving us alone. We love Vicky over here. So with this, um, what are we going to uh, see here? And it looks like this is, you know, really on par with, you know, how Americans typically will view it. That again, affirmative action is not something that has majority support because really the United States is built on, you know, equality of opportunity. And so, you know, equality of opportunity. And in some cases, this also backfires, you know, where somebody will, you know, make a snide remark that somebody got their job or their position as a, you know, as, as an affirmative action hire or something like that. So again, I think it's something, I wouldn't be surprised if the Supreme Court were to just uh, strike that, uh, you know, strike that down sometime in the next, uh, you know, in the next decade. Because again, when you put it to polls, uh, you know, generally Americans of all ages, of all races and ethnicities tend to say that they would rather not have it. Okay, so judicial activism versus judicial restraint. Okay, so as far as that goes, um, this is where, what is the job of a judge? Okay, so judicial restraint is saying that, look, we've got three branches of government. The legislative branch makes the laws. The executive branch enforces the laws and the judiciary judges the laws. So judicial restraint is found is grounded on the principle that, you know, the law should be made, should be written by the legislative branch. That is a fundamental tenet of Republican government. I mean, small r Republican, not the party. So, you know, that we should have that the Congress makes the laws. So advocates of judicial restraint say that a judge needs to just look at the law and they need to be completely impartial, okay? That they need to look at precedent. They need to look at the law itself. Now, remember, precedent is stare decisis. And one of the biggest defenders of the concept of stare decisis would be Chief Justice John Roberts. So as far as that goes, like, for example, when we look at stare decisis, um, you know, Chief Justice Roberts last, last summer, when you had the, uh, you know, the Dobbs case, which overturned Roe v. Wade. And the smaller decision in the Dobbs case was whether to uphold Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. So Chief Justice Roberts, he voted to uphold Mississippi's, excuse me, 15-week abortion ban. So you actually had a six to three decision to uphold Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. But then Chief Justice Roberts, 
he dissented the, from the majority. So Dobbs versus um, Jackson Women's Health Organization. So noting here, let me just run over to uh, the, the about here. And so we see here that, you know, what, what you're going to see here, and this is a good thing to go ahead and mention as well, when we talk about uh, dissenting opinions. So the, the, the decision of the court, the opinion of the court, the holding of the court, they're all the same things. So when you look at this, you had with the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, uh, that this overturned Roe v. Wade, you see that there is Alito ju joined by Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. So you've got five justices in the majority, and then you've got concurring opinions. Now, concurring opinions, that means that the judge has said that the justice says, I concur, I agree with the decision, but for a different reason. Now, Thomas and Kavanaugh both signed on to the majority opinion. Now, remember, all Republican appointees. And then as far as the dissenters, all Democratic appointees. So Chief Justice Roberts said that I concur with the judgment in this particular case. But Chief Justice Roberts said, I don't concur with the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade because John Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, is a big uh, proponent of stare decisis. Now, it looks like stare decisis, okay? When we look at uh, this term, stare decisis. Now, what I think about, this is when you're talking about precedent, okay? What have the courts decided before? Come on, I want my, yes, yeah, stare decisis. So what I think about is stare, like somebody who believes in the principle of stare decisis, I'm staring at the decision. So I'm just staring at it, okay? So Roe v. Wade, I'm not overturning Roe v. Wade, I'm just staring at it, okay? So Chief Justice Roberts says, and this is a form of judicial restraint uh, when you say that I want to respect the precedent, okay? So I want to respect the precedent, and then I want to look at the text of the law, okay? So as far as that goes, uh, you know, Gorsuch um, case, um, Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is another example, I think. Now, depending, one person's judicial activism is another person's judicial restraint, okay? So let's see, Bostick, let's see. So historic decision, uh, let's see. Um, Bostick versus Clayton County, okay? Let's take a look at this. Um, Bostick versus Clayton County. This was a very interesting decision here um, that Gorsuch, now, now what we're going to see here is that Gorsuch was a Trump appointee, okay? So Justice Gorsuch, I think, is probably one of your best examples of judicial restraint, um, you know, because he's a very strict textualist, okay? So he looks at the text of the law. And so when you look at something like this, again, it's not one of your 15. But what you're going to see here is they they had something where and, and this this was a this was a firestorm here. OK, that the opinion of the court, it said that it was a civil rights case in which the court held that Title seven of the Civil Rights Act of Act of 1964 protects employees against discrimination because they are gay or transgender. Now, notice here that you've got Gorsuch, who is a Trump appointee, writing the opinion of the court, saying that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it protects employees who are gay and transgender. So what you see here is Gorsuch joined by Roberts, so two Republican appointees um, who are also joined by four Democratic appointees. And then we see the dissenters, Alito, Thomas, and Kavanaugh. Now, what Justice Gorsuch said is he said, I just looked at the law. The Civil Rights Act says that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as we were saying earlier, it says that you cannot discriminate based on sex. And that's what it says. You cannot discriminate based on sex. So let's say that tomorrow I went to work and I was wearing, you know, lipstick, a dress and high heels. And what if my principal said, hey, Richie, you need to go home and change. You're out of dress code. And I would say, oh, well, I'm out of dress code, am I? Well, let's look at the guidelines here. Um, it says here, the women's dress code says that a dress, high heels, lipstick, you know, there's nothing wrong with what I'm wearing. 
And so what Gorsuch, you know, came to the conclusion of is that the person in that situation, they're not being asked to go home and change because they violated the dress code. They're really being asked to go home and change because they, uh, you know, they, they're a man. So they're being discriminated against, according to Gorsuch, based on their sex. And so that is an example where, you know, Gorsuch, you know, it's like it's, you know, he's not trying to be a conservative. He's not trying to be a liberal. Um, he is saying that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, just looking at it as I see it. Now, as far as that goes, Graham, I would take issue when you're saying that um, so some colleges need fives. I don't know. Give me an example um, just to note here that I have never seen. They may exist, but I have never seen a college say we will only accept a five, but we won't accept a four. Now, I have seen colleges say we won't take a three. Some colleges say you're going to need a four or five, but I would say that you need to get some evidence. OK, SCOTUS is GOTUS. Um, that would be a great shirt, wouldn't it? So one thing just to just to note here that, yeah, I've never seen again, you may be able to provide me with an example, but a five is really just that you are getting goaded for making that five and you've got the bragging rights and all of that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I've never seen an example of a college or university that says we will only take a five because usually your Ivy League institutions, they're just going to say we don't take the AP score, period. So judicial activism, that is where the judge feels that they are called upon to actually use their individual judgment, that sometimes the law, Thurgood Marshall said, uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall, who was on the Supreme Court, appointed by Lyndon Johnson uh, as the first uh, African-American on the court, that Thurgood Marshall said, do what you think is right and let the law catch up. OK, that is a classic statement of judicial activism. And of course, critics of judicial activism, what they say is this is where the judges are starting to write laws. Now, Stephen Breyer, who just retired from the court, um, he wrote a book called Active Liberty and basically a defense of judicial activism. OK, so so again, depending on who you are, judicial restraint says it's up to the legislative branch to make the laws. We are just here to interpret the law impartially. Judicial activists say that I have got, uh, you know, a bigger role for that. OK, so hopefully that helped you out a little bit. Now, as far as that goes, I don't know if, uh, I don't think, okay, Keynesian economics, I, okay, that does show up in the course and exam description, okay? So Keynesian economics versus supply side economics, that's in, uh, you know, in unit four, that this is something that kind of divides, uh, you know, fiscal conservatives from fiscal liberals, okay? And let me see, actually, if I can find a, uh, you know, if I can find a thing here, okay? So I'm just going to run over here real quick and let me see, let me see what I can do. I'm going to run into my Google Drive because I've actually got some, some informal notes where I go into this, okay? So Kane, so let's see, Keynesian economics. Okay, I did that, uh, I did that recently, I think here. Yes, okay, so this is actually, I'm going to pull up some AP Euro notes here. And, you know, and I'm just going to display this. OK, so Euro skepticism, European economic community. I do have something here or I should have something here on Keynesian. Econ well, it doesn't look like. Um, OK, so just to note here, OK, let me just explain. I can't find my visual, but Keynesian economics is basically it's still a market economic system. OK, so Keynesian economics is market economics let me just go ahead and make a little note uh, a little note here okay so keynesian economics it's market economics it believes in you know john maynard Keynes said that there should be private ownership and all of that but keynesian economics says when there's an economic downturn then the government should engage in some kind of deficit spending to prime the pump so to speak okay should engage just a second i need to turn my ac down a degree here I think this this light shining in my face is adding a little bit of heat. So with that, John Maynard Keynes says the government should take action in order to mitigate the effects and kind of get the economy going again. 
And so FDR's New Deal was really the first application of Keynesian economics. Now, conservatives, they are more into what's called supply side economics, what, uh, you know, what liberals are sometimes called trickle down economics. OK, supply side economics is focused on low taxes, especially on people who own businesses and, and are investors. Uh, it's it's a it believes that, you know what, if you free up money like high taxes are bad for economic growth. And so cutting taxes is going to result in more government revenue because it creates a more vibrant economy. Whereas Keynesian economics says that the government should take more of a role in helping through an economic downturn. Now, the problem with Keynesian economics is that it's hard to find an example of it working like it's promised to work, okay? That, oh, well, the government does this. And now one thing that's noteworthy, though, is that Keynes said, you know, he, he was an advocate of tax cuts. He said, if it's, if it's go, you know, if the economy is going down, tax cuts are one way to solve it. Now, the problem sometimes with government spending is that government spending is, you know, not, uh, you know, government spending, a lot of times the government is not the best allocator of resources. Um, so as far as that, okay, so going into, uh, you know, going into this here, um, so let's see here, so best placed, all right, so going through, uh, going through that, let's go ahead and let's see, so we did the Keynesian economics, okay, now again, the counterclaim in the essay, remember, I'm going to be on Marco Learning's channel at 9 p.m. Eastern, and I think we're going to focus that on the you know on the argument essay okay so as far as that goes remember i'm going to be on marco learnings channel if you want to go ahead and uh you know and, and go to that stream mark you know it's uh, youtube.com slash marco learning and then there's also on the youtube stream i've got a pinned chat there okay i've got a pinned chat here so going from there let's go ahead what i want to think about here is think in terms of uh, you know, think in terms here is, okay, we got some uh, some folks there on YouTube getting into this. So I would, uh, what I'm going to say here is let's, uh, let's think about foundational documents and Supreme Court cases, okay? So what I see here, let's go ahead and Sayo, um, let's go ahead and look at the letter from Birmingham Jail, okay? So I'm going to be prioritizing at this point on um, think questions about uh, these, you know, about the Supreme Court cases and foundational documents. So going from there, the letter from Birmingham Jail. One thing that we want to understand in the United States, one thing that comes up in the course and exam description is this idea of ordered liberty okay so we think about like ordered liberty on um, that we have some kind of interplay between uh you know between being free but also having an ordered society that we don't want you know we love freedom but we don't want an anarchy okay so when you look at the Declaration of Independence, let's look at the Declaration of Independence and the letter from Birmingham jail as kind of bookends of the foundational documents. They are the only foundational documents that are not law codes or commentaries on law codes. So when you think about it, the articles in the Constitution, those are law codes. Then Brutus number one, Federalist 10, Federalist 51, Federalist 70, and Federalist 78. Those are all commentaries on law codes. So, you know, when we look at the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, you know, argues that we all have the natural God-given rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And that's where, you know, he's influenced by the philosopher John Locke. So we are looking at this in terms of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And Jefferson, in the Declaration of Independence, he focuses on the right of revolution, that when a government is not meeting the standard of protecting natural rights, if a government becomes a tyranny, then the people have a right to overthrow that government. That is the right of revolution, okay? That's what we see in the Declaration of Independence, is the defense of the right of revolution. Now, Martin Luther King, um, this is something that we have to think in terms of one of the values that we have in our society is the rule of law, 
Okay, so the rule of law that actually comes up a couple of times in the course and exam description. And when we talk about the idea of the rule of law, that means that people in the society, when we think about the social contract that has put our government and society together, that people generally follow the laws. Okay, so the rule of law means that people generally follow the law. And if we don't have the rule of law, then we have anarchy. I mean, if the laws are just on the books and they're not being followed, or if people are just able to just go after whatever whims and they can just know the right person and get out of whatever, that's not the rule of law. So in the United States, you know, we are a country that we are ruled by laws, not people. Okay. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, yes, uh, Macron movie, that's an interesting idea too, that John Locke was a big advocate of religious toleration, but definitely, you know, like other philosophers at the time, Locke was afraid of atheism because he said an atheist is when they swear to tell the truth in court, they don't fear God. So how do we know if we can trust that they'll tell the truth in court? That's what Locke said. But so as far as that goes, though, Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, the right of revolution. But then within the social contract, the rule of law that we agree to obey the laws. So Martin Luther King um, was an advocate of civil disobedience. OK, now remember that it is nonviolent. Dr. King told everybody that was with him, we have the philosophy of nonviolence. Even if uh, you know there's violence used against us, we do not use violence back, okay? And, but the other thing here is the civil disobedience, this is something where people are intentionally breaking the law. So if we think about a sit-in, for example, uh, that people would go into a, you know, such as the Greensboro Four, that the Greensboro Four went into the lunch counter um, in Greensboro, North Carolina. They went and sat at a whites-only lunch counter, and the police showed up. They got arrested. They went ahead and got cuffed. They let the media take pictures of them. What did those guys get arrested for? Well, they sat down at the lunch counter, okay? So Dr. King decided that Birmingham was going to be the epicenter of his civil rights campaign. And so people descended on Birmingham, uh, you know, just came into the, the city in Alabama and, you know, came in with protests, um, were performing acts of civil disobedience, getting arrested. Dr. King himself was arrested. And what happened, the context of the letter from Birmingham jail is that it was a response to sympathetic white liberals, that there were some sympathetic white liberals that said, you know, Dr. King, could you, I mean, we love what you're doing. We're all about it, but this isn't how we do things in the South, okay? That we need to give this time, okay? We need you to be a little more patient. And, you know, what you're doing here, how you're doing it, it's not helping us to try to reform the laws like through legal means. And so that's where Dr. King wrote that, look, uh, a, a person, an individual has a moral obligation to disobey an unjust law. OK, so that's what Dr. King says, that if the law is not in accordance with principles of justice, then a just person has to disobey that law. And so that's where, when you think about Jefferson, if a government is not doing what it's supposed to do, you can overthrow that government. You can basically get rid of the social contract and create a new one. Whereas Dr. King is talking about acts of civil disobedience within the current social contract. Um, that, you know, not breaking the social contract, but in a way perfecting it. So again, the big idea here is that a just person has a moral obligation to disobey an unjust law. So that's what that's what we're looking at there. So going uh, you know, going into going into that, that is the letter from Birmingham jail in a nutshell. Can I explain Baker versus Carr? Sure. Okay. The way that I explain Baker versus Carr usually, um, and because it's easy to get that mixed up with uh, Shaw versus Reno. Now, 
Baker versus Carr and Shaw versus Reno, both of these cases involve political questions, okay? And the thing is that now I noticed, I think the North Carolina Supreme Court, which now has a Republican majority, it had a Democratic majority that had overturned the legislature's map, their congressional district map, the North Carolina Supreme Court, which was dominated by Democrats, um, that they said were overturning the state legislature's map because of partisan gerrymandering. Now, the most recent, they brought it back to the court now that there's a Republican majority. And this court said that this is with the legislature. They overturned on uh, the previous court's decision to invalidate the map. OK, so if we look at here, you know, North Carolina congressional districts. OK, let's go ahead and take a look at North Carolina's congressional districts, okay? And again, we're not picking on North Carolina. These are my neighbors to the North. I'm from South Carolina. But now I'm talking about here, this is similar to Shaw versus Reno, okay? Because Shaw versus Reno was about partisan gerrymandering in North Carolina. And basically that the Clinton administration, Janet Reno, the attorney general, had told North Carolina, you've got to create an additional majority minority district like North Carolina had only one majority minority district and the Clinton administration said you got to make a second one so North Carolina like in Shaw versus Reno and again these guides are available at marcolearning.com so if we're looking at Shaw versus Reno um that let's see Shaw v okay so Shaw versus Reno you had this map where there is this this majority minority district look at this district in the pink okay so when we look at this district in the pink it is just like wow now gerrymandering remember there was elbridge jerry who was in massachusetts he was actually a founding father and he was in charge of drawing the congressional districts in massachusetts and he drew it so creatively to give his party a majority and so they looked at one of these districts and they called it a gerrymander rather than a salamander. OK, so as far as that goes, a gerrymander rather than a salamander. So with that, we see here that, uh, you know, this this was North Carolina's response to the Clinton administration saying that you need to create one more majority minority district. And so they created this district that now this one here, it's bizarre, but at least like there's, I mean, it looks like somebody like spilled some, you know, spilled a glass of water or something, but at least you can come up with some explanation why this, I mean, these two districts are like hugging each other or something, you know, but this, there's no other way to explain this than it just ties together predominantly black areas. And in some cases, it's just the size of a stretch of highway, okay? So the Supreme Court said in Shaw versus Reno, said that race can be a criteria for, a, for drawing congressional districts, but it can't be the only criteria, okay? So this is a five to four opinion that said, look, that there was no way, like this district in North Carolina, it was bizarre enough that it could not be explained as anything other than an attempt to separate voters along racial lines. And so what happens here is the court has said, the court before the Warren court, okay, before World War II, the Supreme Court never got involved in political questions, okay? And so this is a Rehnquist court decision, which is a bit more of a conservative court than the, than the more liberal Warren court. But what's happening here is the court says, look, we are hesitating. We are very, very hesitant. But they said that race can be one criteria. OK, so as far as like if I look at South Carolina. Congressional districts, OK, so if I look at South Carolina congressional districts, that there is obviously one majority minority district. OK, so you see where in most of the state, like my district, the third district, it makes sense. This district makes sense. So does this one and this one. But then you start to see this one just kind of, you know, they're kind of reaching around, putting this here. And, you know, you can see there's a bit of partisan gerrymandering. And what they've done here is they've made District 6. It is a majority minority district. 
And what this does, it on one hand guarantees that black South Carolinians who make up a substantial part of the of the state that they are represented. But we see here, here's an R plus seven district, okay? Then there's R plus eight, meaning that this district tends to vote, it's seven more points likely to vote Republican, okay? So then R plus eight, my district R plus 21, okay? That's the most Republican district in South Carolina. And then we see R plus 12, R plus 12, and then D plus 14, okay? So what this has done, it's, it's made a district where the Democrats are like overwhelmingly more than Republicans, but it puts a lot of Democrats in one place and it makes the Republicans able to secure the rest of the districts, okay? And, uh, you know, Congressman Russell Fry, I, I met him back when he was in his 20s and now he is a member of Congress. Uh, Congressman Russell Fry, shout out over there. So as far as that, as far as that goes, that what it does, it guarantees that there will be a, um, you know, someone to represent the black voters in South Carolina, but it has also made it to where Republicans control six out of seven congressional districts. Now, if we look at the 2020 presidential election in South Carolina, just to kind of show you the, um, you know, the impact of this, that we can see here that President Trump won the state pretty handily, but President Biden got 43% of the vote. So Democrats make up over 40% of South Carolinians, but only one of our seven representatives is a Democrat. Now, the other thing, every time I do this to make clear, I'm not picking on one party or the other, when we look at Illinois congressional districts, okay, by party, there is a work of art. And I tell you, we could talk about whether, you know, gerrymandering is, you know, is, right or not or something like that but you know let's just let's just admire partisan gerrymandering for a second as a work of art okay let's let's just admire it for a moment as a work of art shall we and so with this when we look at what's going on here let me go ahead and open that image so this is a little pixelated it looks like you know what we're going to go back and see if we can because there's going to be a higher resolution um, photo than that okay so let's watch what they did in the chicago area so the illinois uh legislature is democratic controlled right so we'll look at this no no okay that's not going to help us too much maybe it is going to oh, okay there we go so note what they did here in the chicago area that these districts all kind of like it almost like wraps around each other like just again just admire it for a second as a work of art okay and so when we look at all these districts why are they doing all of that and so now we look at look at the chicago area so when we look at this the entire greater chicago area is represented by democrats so why is i mean do you think that there are no republicans in the greater chicago area um, that's certainly not the case but they have been able to gerrymander these districts so that the entirety of the greater chicago area is uh you know is represented by democrats and out of at least 17 districts there are only three look at this one this district 13 that just almost cuts district 15 and a half so again, partisan gerrymandering is not illegal. And a lot of people just, they consider that a political question that the state legislatures have the constitutional authority. Now, so again, Shaw versus Reno and Baker versus Carr, these are both, the, these are both uh, cases that address political questions, okay? Now, of course, there are North Carolina's current districts, which uh, are a little less bizarre than the ones that we looked at there. So this looks a little bit uh, a little bit more straightforward there, but it's, now that may actually be the court mandated one. So then we go back to, you know, we go back to the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the Baker versus Carr. So Baker versus Carr, the way I remember it, if you think about it, a baker, let's say that a baker's making cookies, that the cookies need to be the same size. OK, so the cookies need to be the same size. And that's what I think about when I think about Baker versus Carr. If the baker is baking cookies, the cookies should be the same size. So Baker versus Carr enshrines the principle of one person, one vote. 
Now note here that the dissenters on the Supreme Court, there were two dissenters in Baker, and they objected. They said that, you know, the court is entering dangerous territory because for the first time, the court is, you know, is giving its ruling on the way that legislative districts are drawn. And actually, Baker versus Carr was in the state of Tennessee. So, uh, you know, as far as that goes, the plaintiff was saying that that what's going on here is Tennessee did not per, did not redraw their districts. They hadn't redrawn their districts in like 40 years for the state legislature. But then there had been population movement. So it ended up that not every district in the state legislature, they weren't all uniform in their population. And so with that in mind, they're not all uniform in their population. And that is something that they said that is making some people's votes count more than others. OK, and so the Supreme Court, the Warren Court, of course, and remember, this is the most liberal um, era of Supreme Court history, is they said that this is not um, a political question. The majority said that this is a question of justice because it's a question of are we going to have one person what you know one person one vote does everybody's vote count the same so again one person one vote the cookies all have to be the same size if the baker is baking them that's the way i remember it before then before that i got shaw versus reno and baker versus Carr confused so let me go ahead and mark this question as answered okay i'm finished answering that one all right so with that, it looks like, uh, you know, Junia, I've already uh, done Baker versus Carr and Shaw versus Reno. So Junia, Junia, I'm glad that I got that done. Oh, wow, we've got a lot of those. So hopefully y'all remember that, uh, that the baker has to bake the cookies the same size. So I'm going to be glad that, uh, that that is the case. So let's go ahead and run over to YouTube and see what we've got here, okay? So are there some things here? Um, the difference between conservative and liberal and libertarian. Now, these are all, um, you know, these are all kind of loaded terms here, but a libertarian, that's pretty easy, okay? A libertarian is someone who generally just does not like a lot of government in any part of, you know, whether it's in the economy or whether it is, uh, you know, in their social life or something like that. So as far as that goes, if we think about like, for example, the great society, okay? So libertarians, they say we don't need any kind of regulation in the marketplace, minimal, minimal regulation, that there needs to be a free market and there needs to be respect for property rights. So if we think about, let's see, um, the Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, for example, when we think about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Civil Rights Act of 1968, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So when we think about a libertarian, when we think about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says that you cannot discriminate in public accommodations or in hiring, uh, you can't discriminate against somebody based on their race, their ethnicity, their gender. A libertarian would ask, well, I mean, and not that the libertarian is racist or sexist or anything like that, but the libertarian says, well, isn't that their private property? Don't they own the, re you know, so a libertarian would argue that didn't that restaurant owner put up the capital to make the restaurant like they made their investment. So why is government trying to tell that person what to do? Okay. I got to get that uh, that AC going a little bit a uh, little bit more here. So with that, you know, the libertarian says that, you know, this person's individual property rights should be the most important thing. So the libertarian is very staunchly individualist, staunchly pro-market, staunchly government stay out of my way, okay? I am an individual, hear me roar, okay? Whereas conservatives, uh, you know, conservatives tend to um, favor, you know, conservatives and libertarians in the United States tend to, uh, tend to be on the same page when it comes to economics. But what we want to note there is 
that we see here that, you know, conservatives, they tend to be okay with some, uh, you know, moral regulations and stuff like that. So, for example, in South Carolina, I was just reading that South Carolina's legislature is not going to take action this session on a bill to allow liquor stores, okay, to be uh, to be open on Sunday. So in South Carolina now, for example, don't do drugs, kids. Don't uh, you know? Don't drink alcohol. All that stuff's bad for you, okay? But in South Carolina, there's this bill that's being discussed to allow um, communities to say, like, you know, if there's a beach community, South Carolina is actually the seventh most visited state by tourists. I did not know that. Uh, you know, you've got California, Florida, Texas, you got a few more, and then there's South Carolina. So South Carolina is a very popular tourist destination, and we've got a lot of tourists, okay? So uh, the bill said that you would let, uh, you know, Myrtle Beach, Charleston, you know, some of these large cities that attract a lot of tourists, that they can vote to allow liquor stores to be open on Sundays. And that's not going to be acted on by the legislature. Now, I read in this legislative update that only four states don't allow liquor today to be sold on Sundays. Texas, Utah, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Those are the only four states where you can't buy liquor on Sundays. Now, a conservative, this is where a conservative and a libertarian would disagree, right? So there are some conservatives that would say, well, this is good. Sunday is the Lord's Day. You know, which when you think about it, that there is, um, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, that, you know, when we think about conservatives, Conservatives say, you know, Sunday's the Lord's Day, you know, traditional values and stuff like that. There's no other reason for alcohol not to be sold on Sundays. So somebody mentioned that law of, you know, the wall of separation of church and state, you know, that conservatives tend to be like friendly toward like traditional kind of ideas and religion being kind of low key, like honored by, by the law. Whereas a libertarian would say, why can somebody why can't somebody buy liquor on Sundays? Okay. Why does the owner of the liquor store have to get regulated by the government at all? Because in South Carolina, like a liquor store has to close at 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday, 7 p.m. And that means also like it's not like somebody walks in the door. It's like they've got to shut their door. They can't run their cash register, nothing. So that is that is an example of conservatives favoring government regulation because it upholds traditional morality. Whereas a libertarian and a liberal would both say, like, why are they regulating that? Okay, why, what is the deal there? Um, so again, libertarians can, you know, sometimes go with conservatives, sometimes go with, uh, with liberals. So uh, as far as that goes, let me see what we've got, uh, what we've got here. Um, now, iron triangles, okay, what iron triangles are, this is something that basically when, you know, you have this relationship between political candidates and interest groups and regulators, okay? So, so basically the political candidate runs for office and the political candidate gets, uh, you know, the vote from such and such interest group. Well, once the political candidate gets into office, this interest group did not, uh, the interest group did not end up saying like, okay, um, we're going to, uh, you know, we're just, congratulations, you got elected. The interest group is going to want favors, okay? And usually that favor comes in the form of, friendly laws and friendly regulatory policies and also putting people into positions in the executive branch that are going to be favorable to that industry, okay? So let's say that there's somebody who got elected and they were supported by the teachers union or they got, uh, you know, they got a lot of money from the pharmaceutical lobby or something like that, which the pharmaceutical lobby is a very big lobby. And that's why, you know, when the pharmaceutical industry says jump, the government typically, you know, Congress typically says how high? Because is no matter what party you're part of, you are getting something from the pharmaceutical industry. So this is where we get into lobbying and all that. So the politician 
get supported by the interest group, and then the politician then will, the triangle part is that, you know, they exert their influence on the executive branch as well. So when you put people in charge of, for example, uh, you know, the FDA or, you know, somebody, you know, some other federal regulatory, regulatory agency, the FCC, take your pick that the interest group is expecting the member of Congress to go along with who <coughs> with who they want in that position. Okay, so that is the idea of iron, uh, you know, of iron triangles. Okay, so all right, so let's go ahead and all right, let's see. All right, so going from uh, going from there, um, can you say which articles now? As far as um, somebody asked something about the commerce clause, okay. So as far as that, I think I saw something about the commerce clause that I think is uh, you know is important. But again, um, that is yeah the commerce clause. So the commerce clause, there are two th two parts of the commerce clause. Now remember the Articles of Confederation. It did not give the federal government any kind of powers over the economy. No power over trade. Okay, so no power over trade and no power to tax. So no financial things. Now the context of that, remember that the the Americans as colonists, they had been tyrannized by the British. They had been taxed by Parliament without representation. And so as far as that goes, that's what we're looking at in terms of you know, in terms of the articles. So the Constitution, it preserves federalism. What we want to note here about the Articles and the Constitution is they both are federal, you know, like they both have the principle of federalism, okay? And that is basically this division of sovereign authority between the federal government and the state governments. So the Commerce Clause in the Constitution, it is something of a compromise here that it gives the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce, commerce between states, but it gives the state, it, the states retain the ability to regulate commerce that goes within one, that stays within one state. So commerce within a state, that's going to be the thing. Now, one thing, just remember, I'm going to be in an hour, I'm going to be on Marco Learning's channel, and I want to just note here, let's go ahead in preparation for that. Um, let's go ahead and see, um, you know, how many, you know, if we can get them to the next tier of subscribers. So let me just go ahead and note here, youtube.com slash Marco Learning. They are currently at 33.4 subscribers. Let's see if we can get them to 33.5, okay? So, and that may impact whether I stop this stream at 8.30 or at 8.45, okay? So as far as that goes, whether I go to like 8.40 or 8.50, let's say 8, 8.30 to 8.50, okay? So if we can get to 33.5, 33,500, then, uh, you know, we'll go to about 850. If we're not seeing that number go up, I'll probably cut this out at 830. Rest my voice a little bit, okay, because it's going to be a big week coming up, okay? So again, 33.4, that is youtube.com slash Marco Learning. And note that they've got stuff for, and also you can see here that there are some videos that I made here on the Federalist Papers, on the Declaration of Independence, Federalist 78, Marvel v madison uh, we've got some videos there on that channel okay so again i'm going to be looking for that number to go to 33.5 okay so i'm subscribed you should be too so going from there so the commerce clause now as far as the supreme court cases the commerce clause um that is the subject of lopez okay united states versus lopez so the commerce clause um, you know, we've got here. Oh, thank you, uh, Macron. Um, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be back. I know I've kind of taken a little break from YouTube, but I promise you I'm coming back. Some things are in the works. Stay tuned. So with that, you know, Lopez, basically Lopez brought a firearm to school, an unloaded firearm. But still, like you're not, you know, if your administrator catch you bringing a firearm to school, you can't just say, oh, it's unloaded. So it's OK. Right. No. OK. It's not OK. And so what happened here is that Congress passed 
basically this uh, Congress passed a law, the Gun Free Schools Act, and Congress's rationale for passing this law was that guns are part of interstate commerce, okay? Guns cross state lines. And so therefore, the federal government has the right to regulate anything to do with guns, even bringing a gun to school. Now, even in Texas, a student can't just bring a gun to school, okay? That's not going to happen. A student can't just decide, I'm gonna bring a gun to school. It's unloaded, by the way. No, the question here, the legal question on, uh, you know, in Lopez is does the Commerce Clause allow the federal government to just say, we get to regulate this because the gun crossed state lines? And the Rehnquist Court, um, which again is a more conservative leaning court compared to the earlier Warren Court, the Rehnquist Court says, no, that, okay, that you stretch that Commerce Clause out too far, that the Commerce Clause needs to be about buying and selling across state lines. The federal government has the right to regulate market activity, but when we look at schools, schools are a reserved power. So remember, there are three powers in our Constitution, delegated powers, reserved powers, and concurrent powers. Delegated powers, these are powers that are delegated to the federal government, okay? Powers that are delegated to the federal government. So then um, when we look at, uh, you know, the powers that are reserved, reserved powers are reserved to the states and then concurrent powers are used by both. So, for example, the National Guard, the state militia. So the South Carolina National Guard can be mobilized by Governor Henry, Henry McMaster of South Carolina and by President Biden. OK, so that is a concurrent power. So um, as far as that, um, let me go ahead. OK, I'm going to go ahead and send out links, subscription links to Marco Learning's channel. I haven't seen that thing move over yet, but we've got enough people on the stream to move that number. Um, subscription. OK, just want to make sure that we uh, that we get that. I'd love to see that thing go past 33.5. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, the Commerce Clause, again, that is interstate commerce, and that is only, uh, you know, that it has to be a commercial transaction going back and forth between states. Now, somebody asked me about McDonald versus Chicago. That is one of my favorite cases, okay? So McDonald versus Chicago, Caitlin, I would be more than happy to. Um, that one thing that I recommend is take a few cases okay take a few cases and say that these are my cases 843 we got somebody in south carolina in the pd area okay um so right here in my um you know in my neck of the woods so mcdonald versus chicago basically otis mcdonald uh, was uh, an elderly black man living in uh south side of chicago now may he rest in peace i think he died recently um let's see otis mcdonald yeah, I forget, but it's but it's been kind of recent, I believe. Um, so Otis McDonald, um, let's see, uh, no, that's I'm not finding him there. There's a singer, Otis McDonald. Um, okay, McDonald versus the city of Chicago, but I believe he is, uh, you know, he has died recently. But he was an elderly black man living in the south side of Chicago, and this is a pretty rough neighborhood. Okay, and uh, you know, he believed he said, look. I just want to have a pistol to defend my home. Okay, that's it. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I'm a respected member of the community. You know, it'd been a law-abiding citizen, respected member of the community. And he said that I just want to be able to keep a pistol in my home. So the city of Chicago, they made it so difficult. Like they had all of these barriers that you had to register the firearm. Then you had to re-register it every year. And if you missed a registration, then you can never go back and make it up. So what the city of Chicago had done was it basically had made it to where you couldn't exercise your right. Now, one thing I want to make clear, and it always depends on how a poll is asked. Two things are true when it comes to Americans and guns. First of all, the majority of Americans do favor stricter gun laws as far as making, uh, you know, just having some things to where it's a little bit more, you know, difficult to go through and purchase a gun. But at the same time, when Americans are asked about their support for the Second Amendment, 
there is overwhelming support for the Second Amendment as far as support for law-abiding citizens buying firearms. You know, that's something that Americans have very broad support for. So the thing is that McDonald said, and, and this isn't just a Second Amendment case, this is also a due process case, because note that, you know, your Second Amendment rights can be taken away. Like if I were to rob a bank, all right, I were to rob a bank, I get caught robbing the bank, I am convicted of a crime, then when I get out of jail, I can't buy a gun, okay? It's like, Richie, you robbed a bank, okay? You have gotten due process. Your Second Amendment rights have been taken away, but there was a due process. So I was arrested. I was, you know, brought, I was indicted. I was brought to trial. I was found guilty by a jury, all of that kind of stuff. So the thing that McDonald is arguing and his attorneys is that a constitutional right has been taken away from a law-abiding citizen without due process of law. And so the Supreme Court, they said that, yeah, you, a city or a state cannot uh, make it to where um, it is due process, okay? Like they can't take away a right without due process. And in this case, the Second Amendment. So when we think about, you know, selective incorporation, that every American needs to have equal protection of the laws, that every American needs to have their right to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Now, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and say, let's stop doxing people in the chat. OK, is that doxing? I think that I think that they're doxing uh, when you're putting someone's like actual information. So let's just uh, let's just stop the doxing in the chat. In fact, I think we're going to start deleting um, anything that's got somebody's phone number. OK, that's something I just I do not want to encourage doxing in the chat. All right. So with that, let's just go ahead. No doxing in the chat. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, let's just go ahead and go from there. So McDonald versus Chicago, it is the app, you know, you're selectively incorporating the Second Amendment into, you know, to apply to the states. Remember, selective incorporation is where, you know, you get, uh, you know, you go to, uh, you know, you say that through the 14th Amendment, this part of the Constitution is going to apply to the states. All right. So as far as that goes, We'll go ahead and let's think of another thing here. So somebody's asking about the Federalist Papers, okay? So I think that that is a great thing for us to focus on, is the Federalist Papers. So you've got, you know, Federalist 10, Federalist 51, 70, and 78. 10 and 51 were written by Madison, 70 and 78 written by Hamilton. So with that, remember, ladies and gentlemen, you can go to marcolearning.com and you can download free study guides, including, so you just go there, you go to free resources, study guides, and you can download a U.S. history, I mean, U.S. government study guide for Supreme Court cases and also for foundational documents, okay? So this one is on the foundational documents. You can see a summary of all of these different documents here. So. As far as that goes, what we want to think about is why were the Federalist Papers written? And it goes over all the Constitution stuff as well, okay? So why were the Federalist Papers written? The Federalist Papers were written in order to promote the Constitution to a skeptical audience in the state of New York. And so I've got a longer version of this on Marco Learning's channel uh, where we go into the Federalist Papers. So the Federalist Papers, you know, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay writing as Publius, all right, they are arguing that the Constitution is both federal and Republican, okay? So federal meaning that it preserves the rights of the states, okay? Just like the Articles, the Constitution, it gives powers to the federal government, the state government. And if the state government has a power, the federal government can't go and get it, okay? Just kind of like uh, U.S. versus Lopez. So when we're going from there, what we have to, what we have to understand is that, you know, we're thinking about, you know, the, uh, as far as that goes, when we're thinking about the Constitution, it's federal. Republican means that it is under the control of the people. Republicanism, people elect representatives to, uh, you know, they elect representatives to represent them in government and to run the government in on their behalf. So with that, that the writers of the Federalist Papers are saying that the Constitution is both federal and Republican. 
Now, Brutus, number one, he's an anti-federalist, and he is writing that the Constitution is neither federal nor Republican. Brutus says that this Constitution will create a massive federal government that will take away the rights of the people and the rights of the states, and it will be too far away from the people to control it. So in Brutus, number one, let's put Brutus, number one, versus Federalist 10. In Brutus, number one, he writes that you know, people are going to um, be, you know, that basically this government established by the Constitution, it's going to be so big that the people won't be able to understand the minds of their constituents. So Brutus is arguing that Republican government can only exist in a small political community because in this small political community, the representatives understand the minds of their constituents. They know what their constituents want. Whereas in a larger political community, then the representatives are gonna be out of touch and they can't really take the pulse of their the people they represent. So Brutus says you can only have small republics that, repu you know, you look back at the Roman Republic, it got big, it turned into the empire, right? So then we look at Federalist number 10. And what Madison says here is that, look, actually large republics are superior to small republics because only in a large republic can we break the influence of faction, okay? If we look at just about any state, like the majority of the states, if you look at a map of the states, the majority of the states vast, I would say like over two thirds of the states, almost three fourths, okay? That basically about 70% of the states right now have what's called a trifecta. And that means that the same party controls the governorship, and both houses of the state legislature, okay? So that's when you have a trifecta, is that the same party controls the governorship and both houses of the legislature. The, like about 70% of the states today have this situation where one party is in control. Now, the federal government, what we get in the federal government is that, um, you know, so when, we're, so when we're thinking about the federal government, uh, you know, we see that the Republicans control the House narrowly, you know, the Democrats control the Senate narrowly, and that the Democrats have the White House. And very rarely, it's usually when one party controls all three, they will barely control at least one House. And usually by the next election, there is some type of divided government. Divided government is when one party is not in control. So if we wanted to validate Federalist 10, we would know that there's typically divided government in, you know, the in the federal government, but then in most states, they don't have divided government. So for example, when we look at my home state of South Carolina, Republican governor, Republican Senate, Republican House. And so then when we look at, uh, you know, when we're thinking in terms of California, Democratic, Democratic governor, Democratic senator, Democratic house. Okay, so that's something to kind of think about, think about there. So going up, you know, so going from there, we think in those terms. So Federalist 10, that's where Madison's saying, look, that state governments, those smaller republics, they promote faction. One group of people can take over and the government only serves that group of people rather than the people as a whole. So Madison is arguing that Republican government is only, uh, you know, is actually better in a large republic, which is kind of counterintuitive. So, but that's where it is. Now then, Brutus says that, you know, in Brutus number one, he says that this federal government, there will be certain, uh, there will be certain corrupt people who are going to take over the government and it will become so powerful that it will go into a, you know, it will turn into a tyranny. And so with that, when we're thinking about this, Brutus says this government will turn into a tyranny because remember the constitution while preserving federalism, it creates a stronger central government, okay? The constitution creates a stronger central government. All right, Marco Learning is up to 33.5. I wonder if we can get it to 33.6 by the time this thing's over, but we got it to 33.5, awesome, okay? So I'm gonna be planning on staying here closer to 850, okay? So I told y'all that if we could get Marco Learning to 33.5, that we would extend that to about 850. So true to my word here, okay? So we're gonna be here for a little while. And 
If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe because that's where I'm going to be at nine o'clock. And part of what I'll do there is I will go over the argument essay, okay, and the principles having to do with that. So, so with that, we go to Brutus who's saying this government's going to take over. It's going to turn into a tyranny. Madison in Federalist 51. Federalist 51 is, uh, you know, what we're going to see in Federalist 51 is that Madison is defending uh, the separation of powers and checks and balances. What he says is, yes, this government has more power, but the articles, okay, how did the articles keep the government from becoming a tyranny? The articles kept the, the federal government from becoming a tyranny by keeping its powers low, okay? Now, the Constitution gives the government more powers, the federal government more powers than the Articles had given it. And so Madison says, well, what we're doing here is he says that power must be, you know, power can only be restrained by power. OK, so what 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 Madison is saying is that power can only be restrained by power. And he says also, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. So, you know, Madison in Federalist 51 says that, you know, that we don't, that, yeah, we know that there are going to be bad people in the government. We know that politicians are going to be corrupt, but that's why we've got the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. And each of those branches has checks and balances. So Madison says, not only if men were angels, no government would be necessary, but if angels were to govern men, then you know, we wouldn't have to put checks on government. So Madison says, yes, we are aware that corrupt people will enter the government, but that's why we created this system of separation of powers and checks and balances. Now, another thing about Federalist 51 that a lot of people don't discuss, Madison says, well, let's say theoretically that these three branches of government were going to be these three branches of government were going to all get in a conspiracy together and be corrupt, okay? Then we have the states, okay? So Madison also in Federalist 51 says, we not only have these horizontal checks and balances, legislative, executive, judicial, but we also have the vertical checks and balances. We also have the states, okay? So we also have the states. And so that's where, yes, this government has more powers, okay? This government has more powers, but at the same time, we have taken steps to deal with that, with the separation of powers and the checks and balances, okay? So as far as that goes, that's Federalist number 51, that yes, this government has more, um, you know, has more power, but we've taken measures um, to ensure that that doesn't become a tyranny. So then the next thing that the anti-federalists are going to have a problem with is this idea of a unitary executive, okay? A unitary executive, meaning that there's one person who's in charge of the executive branch. So there are checks and balances between the branches, but in, within the executive branch, there's nobody who can overrule the president. And so it was interesting. I remember at the end of President Trump's presidency that they were saying, well, the cabinet, there is this provision where the cabinet could declare the president mentally unfit. But the problem with that is that the cabinet members all serve at the president at the pleasure of the president. So if the president ever got wind of any kind of conspiracy within the cabinet, that there was talk about declaring the president unfit or something like that, the president could just start dismissing members of the cabinet because they'd serve at the president's pleasure. And so with that, a lot of people were concerned that what is going on? Okay, a lot of people are concerned. And so with that, um, since so many people are concerned, um, you know, with, you know, a unitary executive, Hamilton says, look, the executive branch requires energy. OK, it requires energy. You know, think about like, uh, you know, I think about like, you know, Darth Sidious, you know, with that force lightning, just, you know, like government requires that kind of energy. And you can't have an executive committee. You can't have checks and balances. I mean, you think about this. When President Obama was told that, hey, we know where Osama bin Laden is, okay? President Obama, you know, he can't like just sit there and get this permission and that permission. Sometimes the executive branch has to act, okay? They have to act and you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to go over there to KP and get 
Osama bin Laden. Uh, you know, you just have to do it. Uh, you know, you can't just, uh, you know, you can't just say that, okay, well, let me run this by the executive committee and do all this energy, okay? The government needs energy. Now, that's Hamilton being Hamilton there. You know, Hamilton wants a strong and vibrant and powerful federal government. Now, Federalist number 78. Now, Hamilton, I always find him to be something of a con artist, uh, you know, because the thing is that one of the objections, so Brutus number one, Brutus said that, uh, you know, what Brutus is saying here, Brutus number one, he says that this federal judiciary, that it is going to swallow up the powers of the states, that this federal judiciary, this group of unelected judges, that they are going to become so powerful that it will eclipse the dignity of the state courts. Because remember, the Articles did not have a, judici a federal judiciary. This is an invention. This is an innovation of the Constitution to have a federal judiciary. And so with that, Brutus says this thing's going to get so out of hand it's going to overturn the state courts and all of that, okay? The state courts, bye-bye. So Hamilton in Federalist number 78, he says, the judiciary, it's going to be the least dangerous branch. Like, you're not even gonna feel a thing. You're not even gonna know, it, know it's there. Like, you'll barely see it. I mean, it's just one of those things, was that, uh, was that the, you know, no. I mean, we're, you know, so Hamilton says, you're not even really gonna know it's there. Of course, you know, John Marshall later in Marbury versus Madison is going to give the judiciary branch the power of judicial review, which is never mentioned in the Constitution. But Hamilton said it's going to be the least dangerous branch. Now, also, Hamilton is arguing in favor of an independent judiciary. So, you know, there are the anti-federalists who were actually more in, you know, they wanted a proper democracy. Um, they said that, look, this idea of having these unelected judges who get to serve on good behavior, a.k.a. for life, as long as they're not caught taking a bribe or they're not drunk on the bench or doing something else that's just grossly illegal, uh, they're going to have that job for the rest of their life. And that is a lot of power to place in someone's hands, especially when the person wasn't elected. If you look at the states, most states have some sort of judicial term limits or they have some type of elected judges. Uh, that most of the states do not have this kind of judiciary that we have in the United States. Because Hamilton says that you need to have these judges who serve for life because that's going to make them more independent. It's going to make them more impartial. It is going to be a, you know, it's going to be a truly independent judiciary, which if you ask, as far as that goes, if, if you ask in terms of, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, do you believe, if you ask Americans, do you believe the judiciary is, you know, let's let's go ahead and ask those of you that are in the crowd cast right now, okay, just uh, put in a poll there, uh, you know, do you believe, let's see, um, believe that the Supreme Court is impartial and independent of politics, okay, so independent from politics, okay? So let's say here, um, you know, yes or no, all right? Let's go ahead and see what y'all have to say there, what the folks in the crowd cast have to say about this. Do you believe that uh, the Supreme Court is impartial and independent of politics? And the early returns are saying no, we've got one person saying yes, um, but as far as that goes, it's interesting because, you know, the Federalist Papers are not infallible. And we want to consider, too, the Federalist Papers are about salesmanship. And so when we look at that, that Hamilton is making this argument that is really, uh, you know, not the best of arguments. It didn't really come out that way. So going from there, let's go back to let's go over to the uh, to the YouTube chat. Do we have some folks in the YouTube chat? Let's go ahead and see who we've got there in the YouTube chat. Uh, that, uh, you know, and remember, I'm going to be going on for a bit here. Um, so McCulloch versus Maryland, Dan Mann in the YouTube chat wants to know about McCulloch versus Maryland. OK, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, McCulloch versus Maryland um, is the uh, is basically a decision that it's a supremacy clause uh, decision. Now, let's be careful of what the supremacy clause says. OK, so if we look at the 
the supremacy clause. All right, so let's take a look at this, that it doesn't say that federal law is always going to be, um, is always going to supersede state law. The supremacy clause does not say that, okay? Uh, so as far as that goes, what the supremacy clause actually says is that the Constitution, this Constitution is, uh, you know, is the supreme, shall be the supreme law of the land. So note here, this constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. Now notice here, in pursuance thereof. So federal laws will always be, um, you know, above state laws as long as, federal, as the federal law is in pursuance of the constitution. So when we think about Lopez, for example, the Federal Gun Free Schools Act, that was not um, the Federal Gun Free Schools Act. The Supreme Court said that is not in pursuance with the con of the Constitution because it stretched out the Commerce Clause, uh, you know, to a very ridiculous kind of level. And so with that in pursuance thereof that, you know, that's an example of that. But in McCulloch versus Maryland, the state of Maryland was taxing, placing a tax on the Bank of the United States. Now, the Bank of the United States is never mentioned in the Constitution. Never do we see that the federal government has the authority to create a, you know, a central bank. But John Marshall, you know, believed with Alexander Hamilton, the Federalist, that this is implied, that the ability to create a national bank is implied by the Constitution. OK, so as far as that goes, all treaties made or which shall be made in authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. But again, in order for federal law to be, uh, you know, to be above state law, it has to be in pursuance of the Constitution. So according to McCulloch versus Maryland, John Marshall said that, you know, that's what we've got, uh, what we've got here. And so as far as, uh, as far as steel, yeah, we've got to figure out who's steel, right? Okay, Ethan, chill. All right, so we've got uh, asking Ethan to chill here. So with that, Let's go ahead and um, and think about uh, think about this here. Um, you know, let's uh, let me just uh, just note there. Amicus curi. That is a friend of the court brief. Okay, so Amicus curi um, is friend of the court. Let me see if that's actually identified. I don't think it doesn't show up in the course and exam description. But this is where an interest group. Okay, so an interest group um, can submit an amicus curi brief. And that is something that is, uh, you know, basically saying that we um, are, you know, when there's a case going to the Supreme Court, this interest group sends in this amicus curi friend of the court brief saying that we see that this case is going before the Supreme Court. We would like to make some arguments for why we are on this side or the other. OK, so why we're on this side or the other. So that's something to uh, to note uh, to note here. And Citizens United, okay, Citizens United is always an interesting case. Now let me go. Um, let me go get a little more tea water going, okay? So I'm going to go real quick. We got about 15, 20 minutes left. I'm going to go refresh my tea here. I'll be right back, okay? All right, I'll have to go back and get the water in just a second. So Citizens United, basically Citizens United, speaking of interest groups um, and the, uh, the pluralist theory of democracy. Remember, pluralist theory of democracy says that we have different groups, okay? So Madison in Federalist 10 talks about breaking the violence of faction. Jordan, I went over iron triangles a little bit ago, okay? So with that, um, yeah, AP Euro is actually, um, let's see, we've got somebody asking about AP Euro. AP Euro is going to be 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday this week. So if you're looking for AP Euro content, you are not going to be disappointed Monday through Thursday this week. So 
Citizens United, basically Citizens United was a concert is, is still a conservative interest group. And in 2008, Citizens United, they put out that they made a movie. OK, they made a movie called Hillary, the movie. All right. And this movie was very, very critical about Hillary Rodham Clinton. And Hillary was running for president. So in 2008, she was running against President Obama for the Democratic nomination for president. President Obama ended up, ended up winning that contest. But basically, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, this was a piece of legislation that it was trying to, trying to minimize the impact of soft money. Now, soft money is money that is not given to a political campaign. It's given to an interest group or political action committee or some kind of outside group. So the point of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which some people would say it was really to protect incumbents from being, uh, you know, from being attacked, which I think there's a good argument for that. But it limited the amount of money that an interest group could spend during an election season. Let me go grab my water real quick. Coming back. And so here's the thing, though, that to what extent does that go against the Constitution? Because Citizens United, when you look at this from the constitutional perspective, they made a movie about Hillary Rodham Clinton. And, you know, they want to show that movie. That's art. OK, that is free speech. That's the First Amendment. So the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, tried to tell Citizens United, you can't show Hillary the movie right now because it's too close to an election and we can't allow you to make this expenditure. So Citizens United said that we're just engaging in free speech, um, you know, that we are we made a movie. We made a movie. And so, you know, the First Amendment protects that, uh, that this is political speech and the government can't just say that, uh, you know, hey, you can't do that um, during an election year. Now, one of the things that we'll note is that most Americans would agree that there is too much money being spent on political campaigns. OK, and Citizens United is one of those things that on one hand, it did result in the creation of super PACs, you know, because basically Citizens United said that giving to a political organization. Now, they upheld limits that you can give to a candidate's campaign, but they said, like, if I, you know, just, uh, you know, if somebody, let's see who we've got, uh, you know, in the in the chat here that, uh, you know, we can say here that, uh, you know, if Robert is running for, uh, you know, is running for governor and I say, you know what, Robert, I people need to know who he really is. OK, and I want people to know I'm not running against Robert, but I just think, you know, I just need to let people know exactly who Robert is and what a no good son of a gun he is. And I'm going to put all my money into that. Well, Citizens United says that that's free speech. And Izzy, I'm going to keep running ads until you know exactly who Robert is and you don't vote for Robert. OK, that the Supreme Court and Citizens United describes that as free speech. But as far as that goes, yeah, right. Is that that is true? A low information voter. That it, we have a lot of those in this country, don't we? So, so going going from that, this is something to uh, you know to say. And Robert could say, "Who does this Tom guy think he is? He could run ads against my campaign." And so, Citizens United says the First Amendment is the First Amendment. Maybe Americans think too much money is being spent on campaigns, but the First Amendment is the First Amendment. And so that's now also one thing to note too is Citizens United, it, up, it upheld the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act's requirement that political organizations disclose their donors. Now, Clarence Thomas wrote a, a lone dissent there. That was eight to one that the court said, OK, we understand that, uh, you know, we, we agree that it's OK that you require organizations, political organizations to disclose their donors. But Clarence Thomas, in his dissent, he's the only one saying this, but it's still a, an interesting kind of point he makes uh, because he says that if somebody's going to get reported for giving money to an organization and then people are going to see that information and say, hey, 
you gave to this candidate or you gave to something helping this candidate or this cause, and they could face reprisals for that, okay? Which, of course, we see today, I think, that, uh, you know, there are people who face reprisals for expressing their political opinion. So uh, Clarence Thomas said that the reporting requirement is going to have a chilling effect on political activity. And of course, he's the only one who said that. The other eight justices said we uphold the reporting requirement. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, let's go ahead and mark that question as answered. Okay, so we're going to mark that question as answered. So with that, um, we'll go into. Let me let me just look at something here real quick here. Okay, so okay, so okay, just let me just get something here. Um, Okay. Okay. People are asking about fiscal federalism. Okay. Now, let me go ahead and note in the AP government course and exam description, fiscal only fiscal only is used in terms of fiscal policy. Okay. So what we know as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, we will, uh, you know, we will note here that, let me see, I just need to note here. Um, Okay, um, just one second. I've got my daughters uh, texting me here. Um, so, okay, so as far as that goes, um, fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is Congress's prerogative to engage like taxes and spending. Okay, so when we say fiscal policy, taxes and spending. Fiscal federalism may be in your book, but there's actually nothing like, I don't see the term fiscal federalism in the course and exam description. And so with that, um, just note fiscal policy, taxes and spending, that's Congress. Monetary policy. Now, another thing to note is what about monetary policy? That is something that the Federal Reserve has been um, created to do. So monetary policy, that is where we talk about interest rates and the money supply. So when we think about those things, uh, you know, let's just note there that you don't want to get too deep into something that is not appearing in the, uh, you know, in the course of exam description. So when we look at constitutional interpretations of federalism, we do want to note a couple of things here. OK, so first of all, the Tenth Amendment shows, excuse me, shows up in the course and exam description. So the Tenth Amendment, which says that powers that are not delegated to the federal government, they are to stay with the states. OK, powers not delegated to the federal government are to remain with the states. And then. Um, you know, we see here that, uh, you know, then we've got the 14th Amendment. So on one hand, the Constitution says in the 10th Amendment, Bill of Rights, powers that are not specific, specifically delegated, they're not delegated to the federal government, they stay with the states. The 14th Amendment says that Americans are entitled to due process of law and equal protection of the laws. So those are some things that put federalism kind of in, you know, the court has a lot to, you know, to weigh in on because they have to think about, okay, on one hand, uh, the Constitution says in the 10th Amendment that these powers that aren't delegated to the federal government, they stay with states. But then the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court has to say, well, what about equal protection of laws and due process? And so that's where selective incorporation comes in. So as far as what you need to know from there, and then when we think about the federalism Supreme Court cases, McCulloch versus Maryland, and remember that is having to do with implied powers. Now an implied power, that is a power that is not listed in the constitution, but it's believed to be a power of the federal, you know, basically it's not written in the constitution, but it's, in, it's strongly implied. So the McCulloch versus Maryland says, that the national bank is a is an implied power. And remember, we see here the Constitution is the law of the land, and a federal law is over state laws if it is doing something constitutional. So what we want to note here that 
Congress, as far as that goes, co you know, Congress does not have the power through the Commerce Clause to just do anything that it wants. OK, so that's something that we want to note to note there. So different constitutional interpretations of federalism. Now, as far as federalism in action, so as far as that goes, we do want to note that there is nothing in the course and exam description where you have to talk about like fiscal federalism, layer cake federalism, um, but also we do have things like, you know, now block grants, okay, block grants and categorical grants. Now that's something that, you know, can be on the exam, okay, so block grants, categorical grants, um, categorical grants, that means that it's more specific, okay? It's more specific that the federal government is giving money to the states for school construction, okay? And if you have a categorical grant that is being given to the states for school construction, the states cannot take that and say, we're going to use that to pay teachers, okay? Now, if the states, if the federal government gives a block grant, okay, think of that like just a big block given to the states saying this is for education, then the states can decide how are we going to use that, uh, you know, how are we going to use that money exactly? And if it's a block grant, if one state decides we're going to give our teachers a raise with this money and another state says that we're going to use this for school construction, then that is a block grant. Now, we see a proposal in Congress right now um, that is to ensure that there is a uniform, there is a law enforcement officer in every school in the country. OK, so if that were to pass, that would be a categorical grant. Like basically the states would be being given grants so that they can have a uniform police officer in every school. That basically that won't strain the state's budget. So that would be an example of a categorical grant. Whereas again, a block grant, more flexibility. Like the Welfare Reform Act that Bill Clinton signed, President Clinton signed in 1996, that was a bill that basically gave the states more uh, autonomy, you know, went more in a block grant direction when it came to uh, your know, welfare programs and stuff like that. So with that, um, let's see, as far as that goes, we've got a, got a few people. Oh, we've got uh, somebody. Oh, J.B. Weld again. I tell you what, I love this guy. Um, he is my favorite super chatter. And I will. Uh, yes, the Enlightenment, the Roman Republic. Yes, um, I will. Uh, you know, I, so. Yes, I tell you what, JB Weld is always encouraging me to get back into uh, to get back into YouTube, and I will, uh, you know, get some new videos going pretty soon. I promise. I mean, I've got a lot of momentum here. Also, you know, Hip Hughes. Let me let me remind y'all about my friend, uh, my friend Hip Hughes, that he has done a few uh, videos. Let me go ahead and note this: YouTube.com/slash Hip Hughes. Uh, you know, if you went to his channel today and said, Tom Ritchie sent you, okay, that would be something that would be pretty awesome. So he actually just recently did a U.S. versus Lopez video that I'm going to, uh, you know, that I'm going to send. And, and if you would go to his channel and just comment on this video, Tom Ritchie says hi, okay? So as far as that goes, comment, okay? Comment, Tom Ritchie says hi that'll give you i think that'll give you maybe like a guarantee no i can't guarantee a five on the ap exam that's not going to work there okay so uh you know so go here okay go here and comment tom ritchie says hi okay so we're going to go here we're going to comment Tom Ritchie says hi. That is Hip Hughes' new video on United States versus Lopez. Okay, so I want y'all to go over there. I want to see some things there. I want to see that Hip Hughes knows that uh, you know knows that we uh, that I sent y'all over here. Okay, so just go to that video and just just say. Tom Ritchie says hi. I think that's going to be a really um, fun thing for us to do. Okay, so y'all doing that? All right. So, uh, so also going on from here, I'm going to. Um, okay, so I'm going to go into uh, be going to Marco Learning's channel very soon. Okay, so again, I've got a direct link on YouTube um, to Marco Learning's channel. Now we've got them to. 33.5 thousand. So I think, uh, you know, we did a little bit of extra stuff here. And I will see y'all in about, I'll see y'all at nine.
okay? I'll see y'all at, uh, you know, so I'll see y'all at nine. Oh, thank you so much, Charlotte. I am very, uh, you know, very honored, you know, on Marco Learning's channel. Okay, so go ahead and open up that direct link. Let's see how many people are waiting um, for that because I'm going to be there on Marco Learning's channel. We got 16 waiting right now. So let's see if we can get a few more people out there. Okay, so going from, uh, you know, going from there, we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, and get that going. So with that, um, you know, this is, you know, so if we go to, uh, you know, y'all see me on YouTube, you can see where that's a pinned link. Also, it is in the description. So again, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be going on the Marco Learnings channel, and I'm going to be focusing on primarily the argument essay. Okay, we got 22 waiting. So we got a few people um, going there. So uh, secret line, Tom Ritchie says hi. Not from this one. Yeah, the Hip Hughes video, but I see somebody said here, Tom Ritchie says hi. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, best of luck to y'all, especially Charlotte and other people who've been doing, you know, who've been with me for three years. I am extremely honored by that, okay? So as far as that goes, Bobby, I get that once in a while. And thank you, Vicki, uh, for all of your support over the years in multiple subjects. Um, thank you so much for that. And I look forward again, about 10 minutes from now, I'm going to be on Marco Learning's channel. So come over there and say hi. And remember, go to marcolearning.com. They got some great review guides for you there. So ladies and gentlemen, just remember, most of y'all see y'all in 10 minutes anyway. It's always a pleasure.